WCW Halloween Havoc 1996. No, this is not the one with the monster trucks. It's okay. There's not, there's not zero monster trucks on this show. You got to have at least one monster truck. So to sum up, there's one less monster truck on this show than the previous year, but there's also one more Jeff Jarrett. So I think the math balances out there, but all that and more on Slim Jim's Apron Bump Podcast. Yeah. And the heart is, talk around and disregard it. Ship you off the ground, show you what heart is. Standing strong and proud, nothing can knock this. Let's get started. Yeah. What's up, everybody? How the hell are you? How the gosh darn heck are you, everybody? Welcome to the Apron Bump Podcast. I am your host, the hardest part of the ring, Kyle Bird. WrestleMania season's upon us, folks. You know, talking real time as of recording this. We're, uh, I don't know, two weeks or so before WrestleMania, week and a half ski. How we feeling? How we feeling? Are our, our are our cockles tickled for uh, for Philadelphia this weekend or next weekend? I don't know what day it is. I thought it was November earlier today. It's Feb. It's I just fucking said it's February as if that was the right answer. It's almost April. So time is a circle. Time is a time is a social construct. And yeah, so that's where I'm at. That that that's where daddy is in the head today. Regardless, we have an action packed show today. We're talking a little Halloween Havoc, 1996. Uh, NWO running wild is uh, the overall theme. I would say the overall theme of this show is the NWO is uh, kind of trying to finalize their takeover of the WCW. We've added a lot of members since we uh, last looked at WCW. Uh, Fall Brawl 96 was the uh, latest episode, which, by the way, if you want to hop along this timeline, we started WCW back in uh, Spring Stampede 1994. So we've covered every single pay-per-view since then. And boy, howdy, it has been a boiling, boiling bucket of dog shit, most of it. But past few months have been pretty good. And this show here, uh, I would say at least maintains, uh, you know, the neutral speed. You know, I wouldn't say this is the best show of the year. Or is it? Or is it? Because uh, you're going to have to stay tuned uh, till the end of the podcast where we not only grade this show, but we continue the hardest promotion battle of 1996 competition between WCW, WWF and ECW. So we will look at the show as of the date of the show. We'll compare what WCW is doing with what WWF and ECW are doing. See if this show uh, brought us any of the best or the worst of the year. And uh, we got another one. Uh, And um, so, yeah, stay tuned for that. Whoever wins, whichever company has the most points at the end of 1996, uh, will earn a purchase from myself. I will purchase a championship belt representing that company and i'll hold it you know maybe in the background of the podcast maybe i'll put it around my shoulder maybe i'll hang it from my dung a la john morrison or uh you know we'll experiment with it i am big into experimenting so uh lots going on with that what else what else oh i think i didn't finish my thought earlier if you want to hop along this timeline of wcw join the journey uh, I'll leave a link in the show notes for you uh, for a link to my website, apronbump.com. You can filter to the episodes tab to whatever promotion, whatever era you'd like to hear me recap. Uh, you could select WCW and that'll bring you to all of the WCW events that I've recapped with various guests. It's been a hoot and uh, there's always content. <laughs> nothing else. A lot of times these podcasts are, are uh, at least for me, and doing them, they're more entertaining than watching the shows. At least like 95 it was. But um, like I said, we're getting into a better era here. Uh, late 96. I would say the entire wrestling landscape is pretty hot. Or it's at least heating up. You know, we got a little rolling boil happening. Maybe we don't have, you know, flames abound. But, you know, we got a little sizzle. You know, we put the meat on the... You put the meat on the, the, the deal and we get a little... That's where we're at. 
That's where we're at. Um, I don't even know what I'm talking about at this point, but Halloween Havoc's a good show. We got Macho Man versus Hollywood Hogan for the world title in the main event. We got the debut of Jeff Jarrett. We also got another uh, interesting debut at the very end of this show, which uh, might be one of the worst debuts of all time. So I'll just give you that. I'll, I'll leave you. you leave you with that little little ball tease there. Uh, we got DDP continuing his rise when he faces Eddie Guerrero. Uh, we got an amazing match between Dean Malenko and Rey Mysterio to open the show. That that could be a contender for match of the year. We'll have to uh, we'll have to work through it at the end of the episode here. But a couple tag matches. We got the Outsiders, Kevin Nash, Scott Hall facing the Harlem Heat for the tag team titles. We got the Dungeon of Doom is here. The Horsemen are here. The NWO, of course. A lot of factions, a lot of hullabaloo. It's interesting seeing everything kind of working around the NWO. And not all of it is good, so. But that prompts some interesting discussions here amongst the chaos with my guest, BC Hunter from wrestling with the 80s, wrestling with the truth, wrestling with his sexuality joins me on today's show. I think I made that joke on the last time he was on here. But <laughs> fuck it. We're, we're rehashing. Returning to the show. Always a good time with old BC. old big. Coochie Hunter. I assume that's what the BC stands for. Check out the Wrestling with the Truth podcast wherever you listen to podcasts. It's where uh, old BC mostly rants about the uh, the current product of professional wrestling. Always, it's always interesting to to hear an angry Canadian. You know, it's like a five leaf clover. You never really see it. Um, but also check out Wrestling with the Eighties on YouTube, which is his YouTube channel. Uh, obviously, dedicated to. <laughs> Wrestling with the 80s. And it's a very, very interesting uh, YouTube channel. He does a lot of deep dives into um, just like like kind of what if scenarios, a lot of wrestler spotlights, a lot of just me personally, as somebody who is not super familiar with the 80s, it's always a great watch. It's always fun learning stuff. And he always puts an entertaining spin onto it. So uh, go check that out. All of this, all of these shenanigans will be in the uh, the show notes as well. So go check them out. Give them a subscribe. Give them a follow. Hey, do the same to me. Why don't you, if you're watching on YouTube, ring the bell, ring my balls, and hit the subscribe button. Hit the like. Leave a comment if you're listening. Listen, listening. In audio land, why don't you throw a five-star rating uh, or a 5.25 if, you know, if I say Will Ospreay, will that count? Um, leave a review. I don't know. Follow me on all the social medias at Apron Bump, TikTok, TikTok. I'm, I'm becoming a big TikToker now nowadays. So do that if you're not on the train already. Um, Twitter, I'm I'm. <laughs> oh, if I didn't have to promote my show, I'd be off that garbage immediately. But uh, I think we even talk about that at the end. I can't I forget if that's like during the recording or not, but. Uh, we get into a little, uh, well, we shit on Twitter a little bit towards the end here. But that being said, I think I've rambled enough. Why don't we just get a, get in the Slim Jim, Slim Jim monster truck and skirt our way into this episode? Uh, rum, 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 rum. Do I still have monster truck noises? Hold on. Let me see. Let me see here. Bike. I have a bike noise. Does this sound like a monster truck? Yeah. <laughs> Brum, 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 brum. <laughs> I don't know why I'm still like with my mouth. Um, by the way, I'm not wearing headphones, so I don't know how unbearable that sounded. But uh, all right, let's hit play on this bad boy. WCW Halloween Havoc 1996 with myself and BC Hunter from Wrestling with the Wars, Wrestling with the 80s, and Wrestling... I already said wrestling with my sexuality. Wrestling with, uh... I'm in, uh, Nova Scotia, so, uh... Oh. Yeah. Um, it's been shitty weather. That's what it's been. Just rain and hurricane-like winds and stuff like that, so... Oh, I was about to ask what shitty weather entails up there, because it's always <laughs> shitty, I think, right? Pretty much? 
Pretty much, yeah. No <laughs> igloo, no igloos, though. That's the only thing. <laughs> Next thing you're going to tell me, you don't go outside and spear uh, seals for breakfast. E- exactly. Yeah. Well, we ride them to school every day, right? You know. Right. Yeah. Of course. I mean, like ice, like ice skates. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. The Mounties there. It's a whole thing, right? <laughs> exactly. <Yeah. laughs> Literally, Jacques Rougeau comes up every day and arrests people. Uh, well, I think he's the the emperor of Canada, right? It's emperor up there. Yeah. <laughs> it's, yeah. Trudeau is just a false flag. It's actually Rougeau. Right. Yeah, I figured. I'm glad we're getting to the bottom of this here. It's not all. It's not all about the wrestling. It's we we get to the real issues. The meat and potatoes, as they say. Yes. Yes, they say maybe the meat stick and potatoes. But speaking of meat sticks, Slim Jim's Halloween Havoc, pal. I know. Yeah. What'd you think? Did you get a chance to rewatch the show? Oh, yes. Yeah. Yeah. I got nervous for a second. I'm like, oh, God, is this 95? You know, like thinking it was the uh, battle of the monster trucks. I'm like, no, wait, no, God, it's not. It's 96. So it's you wouldn't want to watch that? I've already watched that and did that for my own show. And, right. you know, that was um, that was enough. enough <laughs> you were set. <laughs> what else was on that? That was not a good show from what I remember, even yeah. outside of the monster trucks. Yeah, it was not. I mean, he killed him. You know, how do you come back from that? And then, well, he did. So, the Yete and stuff like that, right? So, yeah. Oh, Ron Stud. You a big Ron Stud guy? <laughs> I love the name, Big Ron Stud. You know, it's like let's blatantly rip off, <laughs> and let's rip it off. But we'll just change one letter, and yeah. we should be fine. You know, it's like you know, Hulk Logan or something like that, right? Didn't they? Oh my God! Did wasn't there a some Hogan jobber, Randy Hogan, Randy Hogan. That's who it was. <laughs> it's like Hulk Hogan on uh Timu or whatever the fuck. It's it's like the irony. It should that should have been a jobber in the WWE, to be quite honest. You know, when, yeah, when those guys moved over, but yeah, Randy Hogan, yeah. Well, they, I mean, they had uh, fucking Nacho Man and was Huckster. was Hogan's Huckster, Huckster, Huckster. Yeah. Yeah, 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 Scheme yeah. Gene, yeah. Is it back back on Ron Stud? I really need to dive deep on him. It's crazy <laughs> that he was just a jobber in WC, at least from what I've seen. I mean, this dude's eight feet tall. You would I think know. they would try to do something with him. Add him to the NWO at least. Which I don't think he was ever NWO, was he? No, he was in Raven's Flock, right? Oh, I don't know. See, my, my knowledge of WCW is very, you know, I've I've obviously covered what I've covered so far, but you know, I've, yeah. I kind of have loose knowledge because I never really grew up watching wcw and i mean you have right i mean judging by your podcast yeah. it seems like you did right yeah yeah i was around for the war yeah where do you uh so we're, we're here in what october of 1996 so you were you were watching both wwf and wcw at this point live yeah yeah did you have like an allegiance towards either side at this point uh, if you remember yes one second here sorry about that uh yeah no i i was a wwf guy because that's what i grew up watching right like right from the mid 80s so it's funny i was just commenting on something on twitter today about uh the first thing that hooked john wrestling it was like 86 for me it was hogan orndorf Mm -hmm. so growing up i you know grew up that was prime time to really to be a wwf fan because um you know you had saturday night's main event and all that stuff right yeah it wasn't like i was aware of the NWA, i.e. WCW, uh, because of the magazines. That's what I was getting. I couldn't get the actual programming on TV up here in uh, Canada. Yeah. The best we could get is AWA and Stampede Wrestling. Mm-hmm. And AWA at that time was not good. It was on its way out. But the magazines, and then in about 89, I think is when we started getting TBS here. And that's when I, and what a great year to start seeing NWA because I'd heard all this stuff and it's like the Flair Steamboat trilogy years right and yeah great great muda and stuff like that so i was a fan of both it's not like today where you got to pick one or you you know you're you're, you're doomed if you don't if you don't right. uh, show allegiance to one i liked both to be quite honest and i was happy that wcw was starting to gain some traction again because they got really bad right before it and then dangerous alliance came around and that really kind of bolstered them again and then mm-hmm. we kind of Got into that. Well, you probably covered it a little bit, but uh, that really, really, really bad time when Hogan first went to WCW, mm. and oh, mm. and it was just a rehash of just Hogan versus the Monsters and just brutal. Yeah. And then, and then once the NWO started, that's when it was really cooking at that point. But 
yeah i i'm like i wasn't looking for failure for either i was like this is this is great mm-hmm. there's two really cool things to watch and i was just i just finished watching your episode with um um duke and rogue uh mm-hmm. today and you were talking about uh, in your house and i remember that was um to me that was one of those cards that was a real turning point because you had that michael's mankind match which was phenomenal right. and then then we delve into survivor series which is austin and brett which one of my favorite matches of all time and so everything was heating up really well at this point yeah did do you prefer the survivor series match over their wrestlemania match no i still take the wrestlemania match just because there's so many good storylines just thrown in there mm-hmm. but i think the survivor series match gets slept on a lot i still love the way that match was laid out and just the ending and it's again i just saw a clip the other day just of brett talking about that with um austin just making sure that Austin looks strong and defeat in both those matches and you mm-hmm. know mission accomplished for both of them. Yeah, I I've, I've never seen the Survivor Series match actually. So oh, I'm excited yeah, okay. to get to that pretty soon yep. here, but yeah, at this point I would say that the business is is definitely heating up at this point. Obviously, we got the NWO on the WCW side, which we're going to get a lot into here. Yes. Um, but like you were mentioning Mind Games, like Sean's on top, he's having great matches seemingly every time he's out there and you got Mankind yep. and Taker revving up, you got Brett and Sh- uh Stone Cold revving up. So you got like, gold dust, gold dust was pushing the limits and stuff like that too, yeah. right? Yeah. You know? Ahmed Johnson, yeah. Mark Marrow, yeah. Triple H is almost done with his punishment. So like there's okay, some I good got stuff a question for you. I got a question three, for you, Kyle. Three inches flaccid too erect. <laughs> was that not your question? Sorry. <laughs> I thought it was Batista's we were gonna talk about, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um so you're you're obviously like you said, you are kind of seeing some of the stuff for the first time. Um mm-hmm. What were your thoughts on Ahmed Johnson looking back on it now? He definitely, I like him. I mean, he, mm-hmm. he, cause he's definitely like, there's nobody else like him, especially at the point, um, you know, in 1996, he's just like very, I, I generally find myself, uh, fans of guys that are a little rough around the edges, like not yep. super smooth, even though, you know, look at it from a worker's standpoint, obviously that's not really what you want, but mm-hmm. like the Goldbergs, like people post gifs of Goldberg dropping people on their head. And it's like, okay, mm-hmm. as a fan, it's kind of, I kind of like that, even though obviously mm-hmm. it's not what you want, but, um, Ahmed Johnson, he's, when he talks, you can't understand what he's saying. He's just, <laughs> uh, he's just a bull in a China shop and I love it. He's so wet, uh, <laughs> jacked, the power bomb, the music, all of it, I, the, the more wet you are the uh the more inclined i'm gonna be to be a fan of you which is why i'm a big yeah. uh, lex luger fan as well so big sid fan i imagine too oh dude i've i a lot have of turned there a lot of women 180 on sid when i first started watching yeah. sid here when he was like in the million dollar corporation i was like all right i don't really not not feeling it but man you, you turn him baby face you let him loose just oh man it's great stuff even luger luger kind of the same i've kind of become yep. a, a bigger fan of luger the more i watch him so 96, 97 run for both those guys is their best. Well, I, I oh, mean, yeah. obviously Luger, like say like 87, 88, but come on. But 96, 97 compared to the, the 94 run. What a great job they did with both those guys. Yeah. 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 You, you weren't a part of the Lex express. <laughs> no, I was you, not. <laughs> you were, you weren't all aboard. He lost me when he celebrated the uh, count of victory over Yoko at the Oof. SummerSlam. I mean, come on. Seriously. Yikes. Yikes. Yeah, it's well, hmm. we get uh, we get some count outs here, I believe, on this show or yeah. views, you know, whatever. It's kind of a gray yep. area and uh, some fucky finishes here all because it is WCW mm-hmm. after all. And even like when stuff's good, like it seems like they never have like a good finish to these matches. They're all kind of well, like I said, we'll get into it. But yeah, um, overall, Halloween Havoc 96 thoughts, uh, thumbs up, thumbs down. Them up your ass. Yeah. What do you, what do you, what do you throw at it? <laughs> I don't want to spoil anything, you know, because I want to make sure people listen to the very end to get our overall thoughts on this. But uh spoken like a true podcaster. Um <laughs> get that but, Yeah. It's um I would say it's a tale of two shows, is what I would say. I, when I started watching this, um, I watched it last night just so it'd be fresh. And um when I started watching it, I was like, this is a this is pretty good to start off with. It seemed like it was moving along quickly, even though the first match was long, but that match was great. So mm-hmm. you can't fault that, but I felt like it was moving along pretty good. There was some entertaining stuff. We got some good wrestling action for sure. 
And then all of a sudden, as soon as the NWO started coming into play, it seemed like it just kind of started to slow down a little bit. And then we won't, we'll save the end for the end mm-hmm. because that's all. Oh, you know, that that really made a difference in the whole feeling of the pay-per-view. I would but... say this might be the worst pay-per-view ending I've ever seen in my life. Yeah, yeah. I mean, what the fuck? I mean, uh, I, I, immediately when I uh, saw what happened, I'm like, it just flashed back to uh, Sting's retirement match, right? And how everybody complained about <laughs> going off the air. And I'm like, oh, well, why don't you watch this show then? <laughs> yeah, I don't think... Uh... I don't think people back in 96 would be seeking out the rest of that promo though. Oh, you know, no, what I mean? no, no, they, 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 <laughs> old yeller needed to be put down at that point. Yeah. yeah. Good start. Good debut at the end here, folks. <laughs> a little tease there, but, uh, before that we got, uh, so I don't, I don't know if you realize this watching the show, uh, Slim Jim was sponsoring the show. I don't know I, if you realized it. It was not evident. Hmm. Yeah. It was slightly after the giant monster truck is when I when I realized they were sponsoring the show, uh, but only after that. Yeah. Right. Not the Slim Jim uh corner posts. No, no, no not no. the t-shirts that they were wearing with the Slim Jim logo, like the Dusty and Bobby and Shivani. Not no. the draw for the monster truck, which I want to get into that. Oh, don't you worry, we will. <laughs> <laughs> not the countless um, references to Slim Jim. It, not even that giant monster truck. I still had questions, but it seemed like it was after that when Macho Man had the match. Yeah. Boy, I got a lot of monster truck questions when we get to that point. But, uh, <laughs> I mean, two Halloween Havocs in a row where monster trucks are the uh, focal point. But Yeah, they're really big on the monster you. trucks, yeah. What do you think of these polos of the commentators that they're wearing? Matching polos. Do, I think, do, they, have, do they have Slim Jim on them? They, they have the Halloween logo, the, 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 le, the guy, the monster holding the Halloween Havoc uh, Slim mm. Jim sign there. Yeah, that's what they had on them. But um, they worked for Shivani and Heenan, but Dusty and Apollo is just not doing it for me. Man. I kind of liked it. His was a little more fitted. It was fitted. Was, <laughs> was, <laughs> maybe. I mean, every shirt's probably fitted on him. But <laughs> um, but yeah, so that, that's how <laughs> the show opens up. It also opens up with a package. Uh, kind of reliving the uh, build up to the show. Obviously, very heavy on the NWO. We got uh, so where we are in the NWO timeline, we have begun to add members. So the giant has been added to the fold, as well as uh, Virgil or uh, was he Vincent? Uh, Ted DiBiase, six debuted, aka X Pac. Um, who am I forgetting? I think I'm forgetting somebody. I might be it at this point. No, I think that's it. Yeah. This yeah. is pretty much where they should have stopped, you know. Right. Yeah, it's it's interesting because I've always heard that like the NWO just got way out of hand. So I'm like kind of trying to see where that balance kind of shifts. But I think at this point, they're they're running pretty solid here. But yeah, um, it's really the back half of this show. It'll be more NWO uh, NWO heavy. But mm-hmm. um, and there was a nitro leading up to this where uh, a lot of the WCW wrestlers went to Japan to wrestle. And this allowed NWO to kind of take over the show. So it was like the whole show, like the giant came in and he was the ring announcer. Yeah. And Ted DiBiase came in and took over commentary and it was just non finishes and beat downs for like the last hour of the show, at least. So they're really putting over this NWO here. I mean, it's, we hadn't really seen anything like this, at least in, you know, American mainstream TV for sure. I mean, what did you think of this NWO? Like as it was happening, as it was building, did you know it was a big deal at this point? Never heard them. Yeah, yeah, they're an yeah, no. indie, indie <laughs> band, I think. Yeah, they're not the elite, so, you know. Um, no, 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 no. <clears throat> yeah, I mean, obviously, just absolutely unbelievable angle that they did. And it was such a marked difference for WCW uh, for being more gritty and real versus mm-hmm. WWE, which was so cartoony at that point. Um, so I know Bishop always talks about, well, whether it's true or not, he wrote things down. He said, okay, well, let's do the opposite of, of what they're doing. We'll use the real names versus use the gimmick names. We'll be black and white versus all the colors that WWE has. Right. And it worked. It, honestly, it worked. I mean, uh, one thing that, you know, it was evident because, uh, yeah, again, like I had to put myself back to that time frame. I'm like, geez, this is only what? Uh, it was It was July when the Hogan turn happened, was it not? Mm-hmm. Yep. Yeah, okay. So we're talking four months since Hogan had the biggest turn in wrestling history, right? I mean, that's that's a pretty yeah. big deal. And then we're only what six months out of Hall's famous showing up and and you know 
mm-hmm. his whole speech. And so I put myself back to that time and think, wow, this is pretty, pretty cool. Like this is pretty cool what they did. And it was miles above what WWE was doing at that time. Although you could feel WWE starting to get a little bit gritty themselves, but mm-hmm. they weren't quite there yet. But um, yeah, they, I mean, what can you say? The, the original NWO incarnation was so well done. So good. Although, as you mentioned, they were really starting to get into that whole a little too much of the beatdowns and the taking over and stuff like mm-hmm. that. I mean, not so much. I know what they were trying to do with their gang and all that, but it felt like they shouldn't have been able to get so much access to people at this point. Right. I think, you know, yeah. it's it's becoming a little bit obvious that they're working together with that. But yeah, overall, and then, of course, we'll get to it in the Hall Nash match. But it's unbelievable how much of a cool factor they brought to um wcw oh, yeah. and to the nwo side of things especially compared to hogan in the next match yeah no it's just natural for them compared to yeah. hogan for sure and it's it was striking to me because your point it's only been a few months since the nwo has kind of yeah. started and it's crazy how over they are already like there's the nwo shirts are all over the place already it seems like every time there was an nwo wrestler in the ring they were the more favored by the crowd yeah. so it's already mm-hmm. you know they're already gaining steam here um but maybe at what's, the and what's of freaky stuff but who knows what's freaky too kyle is like in a in a few months then you all of a sudden you have the explosion of austin too right like it's like yes in this time frame in a one-year time frame you had two of the biggest uh, entities ever occur which is amazing to me yeah no we're uh building to the attitude era here which is very mm-hmm. evident but uh before that we open this bad boy up with a cruiserweight title match the champion Rey Mysterio versus Dean Malenko. Man, these two guys, they're like yin and yang with <laughs> each other. Like the chemistry is just incredible. Like mm-hmm. obviously Dean's more grounded style and Ray's high flying style. But I feel like that just like it, it plays into both of their strengths when they're facing each other. So I, I just I really enjoy watching these two guys wrestle whenever they do. Um, this might be my favorite version of their match that i've seen so far i think they had a match maybe bash at the beach or something like that um and then they had like at least one or two on nitro but this match yeah. i thought was awesome the, the counters the the callbacks to the previous matches i would say match of the night for sure for me yep but yeah uh, what do you think about this one completely agree with you um this is back when bischoff had the formula down pat you know like uh it's like okay throw a couple of cruiserweights out there just to get the crowd jacked up for it then we'll throw a DDP match on afterwards because he just got that, you know, he's just so good at getting mm-hmm. the crowd going. And then we'll work our way into the to the main events and stuff like that. But yeah, like, I mean, first of all, can we talk about praise to the guy in the front row who had the airbrush Papa Shango sweatshirt on? Did you notice that? <laughs> I did not notice that, no. <laughs> what a There's choice. Three guys, three guys in the front row that are like, you know, all jacked up and, you know, just into it and i mean aside the fact i know he's got a cell phone so everybody's actually watching the matches which is pretty cool but one at one point one of the guys stands up and it's a completely airbrushed sweatshirt and it's got papa shango's head on it which is just amazing to me but yeah Man. it's so funny like uh, my wife was uh watching along with me for the first little bit and uh, i didn't think she'd last long but she actually was kind of enjoying it because you know like the right away it's the malenko uh, Mysterio match, but she's like, she's looking at Malenko and she's like, is, is, is he a little person? Or something like that? <laughs> he is like almost such like a proportional unique body type, right? It's such a unique body type. And uh, and then I was explaining it, was giving, she's like, he's not selling, is he? And I'm like, no, no, he's he's the Iceman. So that's his whole character. And then she mm. understood that. And then she's watching Ray sell and uh you know ray do it and ray's like what 21 here or something like that just maybe yeah something like that yeah it's just gross how good they are at this point but match of the night easily and they could they even have a bad match together like it's just crazy yeah it's yeah it can only be so bad between these two and like i said it kind of plays off their previous matches where dean is he just keeps losing the ray so he's pissed off so he goes for the clover leaf right away but it gets countered and then Ray, of course, you know, utilizes all his high flying stuff. So we see a lot of springboards and uh, planches to the outside. And then uh, also, by the way, Dean comes out with one of Ray's masks. Yeah, that he pulled off of him on a Saturday night a few weeks ago, and he's been carrying it around with him. And 
<laughs> sticking it on the corner post, like a like in like a tiki torch kind of deal. Yeah. <laughs> um, but Ray eventually he grabs the mask and he like replaces his exi- existing match with that mask, and that was pretty cool. <laughs> yeah. So a good good amount of storytelling in here uh, outside of the work raid, but yeah, just the counters is like you weren't seeing anything like this anywhere at this point. It's the seamless like ray will be on dean's shoulders and you'll flip him off and you'll land on his feet and then they'll like counter roll up pins and i mean it's just it's not really non-stop the whole way through because dean does slow it down but that kind of plays into his strength so that all yeah. makes sense um it's really good near falls towards the end too where ray does a rana into a really close pin uh a near fall and then he comes off the top rope but dean counters into a power bomb for a two count Crowd is uh, red hot for it at this point. And then the finish comes when uh, Dean counters a... You got something to say, Dwayne? You got something to say? <laughs> he, uh, yeah, Ray runs up to the top rope to try to hit Dean with a Rana off the top. But Dean counters it because that's how he lost their previous match. Yep. And hits him with an avalanche doctor bomb off the top rope for the win. And becomes the new... Cruiserweight champion. So the Iceman comes out the champion here. And uh, yeah, like I said, I can't say enough good things about this one. Oh, man. And that finisher was just devastating looking. I mean, everything Malenko did look so stiff. And that's mm. a, it, and it, can't, it was such a nice contradiction with uh, with Ray's style. And yeah. Uh, but yeah, and they told a story like he was grounding him the whole match and stretching him and just trying to make sure he didn't get any of his aerial stuff in him. And then Ray would have little spurts of offense and the crowd would get up for it. And then it get shut down. Just everything was just, it was just a great start to the show. Yeah. And like, yeah, like you said, you could tell the quality of a match. I mean, there's no better measurement than how into it the crowd is. And they were red hot towards the end of it. So awesome stuff. And it's only downhill from there, but um, <laughs> <laughs> it's actually, I mean, the show overall, I mean, it's not a bad show, but like yeah. nothing was stopping that. Yeah. Um, well, I say that, but we got so we got Jeff Jarrett backstage next uh, with Lee Marshall, which, by the way, is Mean Gene not around at this point? Do you know? I was I was thinking the same thing. Where's Mean Gene at? Because he was a fixture there, but I'm assuming maybe something was going on. Maybe he had a he family had like thing surgery or, or, or something. Yeah, I'm not sure. Circumcision, something. I don't know. But <laughs> um, we got uh, Lee Marshall backstage, another mustached man with Jeff Jarrett, who uh, just debuted in WCW a few weeks before this. We got babyface double J here. And uh, it's one of my favorite things that wrestlers do when they're nervous during a promo. They'll be like talking and uh, listen here. <laughs> so I'm going to take you. <laughs> and then I'm going to, if I had to take a drink every time he says, ha ha during this one promo. <laughs> you're yeah. be so it was, that was the only note I had on that segment. It was just hilarious. I, uh, I picked up the same thing and I'm like, and I'm like, it, it was really obvious. I'm like, is he just trying to get over the whole double J stuff where he do the J A ha ha thing? Right. But uh, I don't know. Oh, it was yeah. really painfully obvious that he was doing it. Quickly Marshall fact, you know who he was the voice <laughs> of, right? No, please tell me. <laughs> Famous serial mascot. Is he uh Tony the tiger? He is Tony the tiger. No shit. Wow. Yeah. I did not know yeah. that. Now, whenever you hear his voice, you'll, automatically you realize yeah i'm playing in my head so that makes sense Mm -hmm. um but after that we follow that up with ddp diamond dallas page versus eddie guerrero which uh on paper is just a very interesting matchup doesn't seem like a match that happened but uh we're following up uh, ddp beating chavo guerrero at fall brawl the previous pay-per-view and uh tell me what you know about this battle bull ring so yeah, so that came from there was a tournament. I forget what year it's there. It was year ninety three or ninety four or something like yeah. that. And um, it was basically t- random tag teams got involved in these tag team matches, and the winners advanced to this final battle royal. And it was the battle bowl, battle bowl ring. Yeah. Like, it's kind of similar to what AEW was doing with that ring for um, MJF or whatever. But uh, and then, yeah, DDP won it the first year and he was down on his luck and he finally had to turn around and all this. And then he had the story with Kimberly and the booty man and all that stuff. Oh. And then his, you know, year long feud with Johnny B. Bad. <laughs> and, um, yeah, it, it, it was a fixture with DDP for those first few years. 
Yeah, it's it was very vague. The uh, like, what does it mean if you have the ring? Because in the it means least, nothing. You just won that whole th- that that thing. Yeah. Well, they were building it. I, what was it? Slamboree, I think it was where the battle bowl was at. And it was like whoever wins this is going to get a title shot at the next pay per view. But then they just didn't follow up on that. And now there's like no like, oh, he might get a title shot at some point. Uh, but it's really they're just fighting over a ring because Eddie Guerrero beat DDP on uh on tv at some point and took the ring from him so now they're battling for the ring here again i guess but there's no reason to have the, i don't know it's all very vague and stupid but yep um that being said the match i thought was pretty solid i thought the um i like how they just start off with just like trading slaps and then brawling to the outside it's there's it like a like a genuine animosity it felt like between these two and both these guys are like just starting to hit their stride here so i enjoyed this one for what it was worth though what do you think about it i did too the only thing i didn't enjoy was nick patrick we have way too much nick patrick in this foolishness with the evil referee and all that in this match I mean, you gotta but, respect him fighting through the injury though oh yes you know? yes i do yeah um but yeah i love this era of ddp um this is probably yeah. my favorite era is from 94 to 96 ish before he gets too big and that stuff yeah, and yeah. i mean something i just you know noticing watching is Man, he could sell his ass off too. I mean, like for oh, a yeah. big dude, I don't know, he's like six five or something like that. He's also thirty eight years old at this point, I think too, and he is bumping like crazy for Eddie. He was great getting heat with the fans. Of course, Eddie is like smooth as silk in that ring. It's just amazing how good he is. And it, yeah, it worked. They they had a. I don't know if he had as good a chemistry as he did, ironically, with Johnny B. Bad, but he had some great chemistry with Eddie, too. So, um, mm-hmm. yeah, again, it was back-to-back matches where I'm sitting there going, I'm really enjoying this pay-per-view so far. Yeah, no, I agree. And one question I had watching this is, like, is Eddie, like, starting to turn heel here? Because there's one point where he just kicks DDP right in the dick, right in front of the ref, by the way, which is, <laughs> like, you know, whatever. Uh, everybody gets a mulligan, I guess. And then yeah. uh, some, like, eye rakes, too. I don't know if that was maybe just playing into how much he hated him or whatever. It's the intensity of the match, but. Um, well, it's, yeah, it's, he's a heel by Halloween Havoc of next year for sure. Cause he has that match with Ray. But, um, I forget when he turned heel officially, but yeah, I don't think he was far off from this to be honest. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm waiting for that day, but, um, but yeah, outside of that, the finish was very interesting, though, because, I mean, yeah. you know, it's, it's it ramps up towards the end. There's like pinfall. There's roll up trading. There's two counts. But then so DDP wins, but he wins. in a very, it was like so he hit the flapjack, which is kind of like a styles clash type of move. And then he there's like a delay. He kind of walks around, picks up Eddie slowly, and hits him with a spinning power bomb. Mm-hmm. Then I think he pins him, maybe gets a two count and then kind of walks around, you know, plays to the crowd and then he like locks in Eddie's head to go for the diamond cutter. And I'm watching this. So I'm like, Oh, Eddie's going to counter. Cause he's like building mm-hmm. up to this way too much and way too slowly, but they just hits the diamond cutter and then that's it. Like it's very like anticlimactic yep. finish here. But uh, I mean, we're still the diamond cutter is already taken off as a huge finisher at this point. So they were, um, the announcers yeah. were selling it like it was the most devastating finisher. I, it, honestly, it was probably mm-hmm. the worst diamond cutter I've ever seen him put on, but I'm with you. <laughs> I'm with you. It, it, it felt like there was something that was supposed to happen there and it didn't. I don't know. Maybe Eddie got no. his bell rung or something or somebody forgot their cue or whatever happened. But yeah, it was really strange because the rest of the match was just like clockwork. Yeah, but um, I mean, it, it was different, I guess. So I'll commend them for that. But it was clean, yeah, to your point. I guess. Yeah, <laughs> for, uh, I guess DDP was more clean than Eddie was in this match. But apparently. But the, the real story here is that DDP finally gets that ring back and, uh, you know, can't stop him now, right? Got that jury, but uh, we'll see what comes of that, if anything. Probably not. Uh, but we got Mike today backstage with uh, the Macho Man. And uh, as a reminder, this show is presented to you by Slim Jims. What? Um, yeah, maybe this podcast. Maybe I'll try. I'll reach out to Slim Jim and see if they can sponsor <laughs> this episode. Um. <laughs> But uh, so there was a sweepstakes to win a Slim Jim monster truck. Did you enter the sweepstakes? I did not. I don't think I qualified here in Canada. 
unfortunately. Uh, that sounds discriminatory. We don't have sli- we didn't have Slim Jims in Canada at this point. We had a uh, Schneider's Hot Rods. They were called. <laughs> I was going to like make up a Canadian sounding name, but that is more Canadian than anything I could have made up. Yeah. Schneider's hot rods, folks. That's yes, exactly the Canadian version of Slim Jim. How were they in comparison to Slim Jims? I have never had a Slim Jim, to be quite honest. So for meat on a stick, it was pretty good. Yeah. Yeah. You're a, you're a Schneider's guy through and through. Schneider. I like it. Schneider. <laughs> well, uh, so Macho is here to, uh, Pull the winner of the Slim Jim sweepstick. Did it have a name? Was it just Slim Jim sweeps? That's a hard thing to say. Slim Jim it's, sweepstakes. Yeah. <laughs> by the way, my, this is my favorite part of the whole show by far. Well, please take many us through it because there was a lot. There was a lot going on here. But, <laughs> well, oh, yeah. one Savage was just like coked up or something here. Um, what? <laughs> to the giant that the, they didn't have a drum in order to do it. They just had this giant slim jim which is just a hollow tube basically painted like a slim jim which was cracked in half that he pulled the top off and so <laughs> had to really work it. to get that off by the way the, oh, I, I know yeah. <laughs> mike today can, is just losing his mind here at, at savage savage is just ad-libbing like crazy the mm. the prize that they get is a slim jim's monster truck by the way because hey who who doesn't want a slim jim's monster truck and um and then the best part of all is the winner is a person. What was her name? Joan Michalik or something like that. Yeah, who I guarantee like you, Joan is probably seventy years old. <laughs> when in the, when in the, when in from the, Romulus, Michigan, which doesn't yeah. sound like a real place. Went in the monster truck. So I'm just picturing Joan with that thing arriving on her front door. Uh, uh, yeah. So it was so good, so good. So from my understanding, it's not like a literal monster truck. It's like a, a, just a big truck. But even even still, it's like, I bet it's just gaudy. It probably has the Macho Man hat on it, like the monster truck in this show. <laughs> so Joan Michalik wins this monster truck, and Macho's like, well, let me take you on a date. And we can ride in the monster truck, which begs the question. Do you think that Randy Savage gave her the old uh, meat stick in this uh, monster gave- truck? He gave her the old how's she going, if you know what I mean, right? Yeah, I, I do know what you mean. Gave, gave her a good hot rod, maybe, <laughs> perhaps. <laughs> he gave her the Michigan, old so. Schneider. <laughs> they probably have Schneiders in Michigan. I bet you they do. That's close enough. Um, well, glad we got that covered. Um, so Slim Jim's Halloween Havoc continues with old Double J Jeff Jarrett taking on the Giant, which uh, kind of had me intrigued looking at this on paper, but uh, I don't know, man. I mean, it was fun seeing, you know, giant throw Jarrett around like <laughs> Jarrett locks in a headlock and giant just fucking shit cans him. His shot puts him like 100 yards. Um, so that was pretty impressive. But otherwise, it was kind of just a classic giant versus smaller guy type of match. But um, and also, by the way, just Ric Flair is a part of this. He's probably actually the most active of everybody involved here because flair was taken out by the giant on nitro flair who by the way is the united states champion at this point giant and the nwo beat him down took his title so now giant has possession of the u.s title so i guess i guess much like the the battle bowl ring i guess that makes him the champion because he has it and uh by the way giant i think last year halloween havoc he took the world title without winning it so it's a theme with him uh so yeah, so that's a thing. Flair's aligning with Jarrett because Jarrett comes in. He's like, I'm sick of this NWO crap. Yeah, I, I, I respect the tradition of WCW. <laughs> <laughs> I forgot the ha ha. <laughs> and he runs down all the names. Like he likes the tradition of WCW and doesn't like the NWO. So that's why we have this match. But uh, ultimately, I mean, it was whatever. It was a DQ finish. I don't know. What'd you, what'd you make of this? Uh, I just wrote down, this was a bit of a cluster. Um, this is yeah. to me where the, the show kind of started to slow down. Uh, this whole thing, it just, it was a clash of styles that didn't necessarily work. I, I respect the hell out of Jeff Jarrett now <laughs> after yeah. his career. But at that time I could not stand Jeff Jarrett and not in a good, like, Oh, he's a great heel type of way. It was more like, you know, how people used to talk about Xbox and stuff like that. It's just, 
Mm-hmm. He wasn't somebody that I enjoyed watching on my TV. And uh, so seeing that, and I, so I couldn't cheer for him. And I didn't necessarily want to cheer for the giant either. Flair was just off the rails here. Like, it, like it, he just grabs the microphone halfway through the match. It makes no sense. At a, I don't know what that was supposed to do. Giant no sold it. Jarrett was confused by it. Yeah. And then, yeah. And then the ending with the low blow and that. It was just, uh, <laughs> uh, it, this, is, this was a cluster uh, to, to me. Yeah. Yeah. Flair was, to your point, he was on one. I mean, he started like in the aisle way. And then it was like walking all the way around the ring. And then at one point, he like grabs a chair and brings yeah. it in the ring, but doesn't use it. He's just like teasing it. So he's just, it's almost like he's just trying to pop himself with this stuff. Yeah. And he grabs a mic. I think Jarrett is in like a bear hug or some shit. Yeah. Flair grabs a mic and he's like, come on, Jarrett, get out of here. It's like for, for no reason. Like he didn't need the mic. You can just yell. Um, but yeah, like I said, Flair was really the, the focal point, it felt like. And they fight to the outside at some point. Uh, Giant has Jarrett goozled for a choke slam, but Flair comes behind with a low blow and obviously DQ finish, uh, giving the Giant the win. And uh, the horsemen come out to kind of, I don't know, run off the Giant. Giant runs away, but he gets the win. So uh, NWO is, is this the first NWO match? I believe so, right? It is, yeah. So mm-hmm. 1 0 so far, NWO is. Um, but after that, we got, uh, all right, so Ted DiBiase, I kind of like how they did this. Ted DiBiase, who is a member of the NWO, obviously, um, he's kind of the stand-in uh, announcer, backstage interviewer, but on the side of the NWO. And he's conducting interviews with all the NWO guys in the audience, in the stands. Um, and he's conducting it. So there's always a lot of discussion about like who the best guy on the mic is in wrestling. But I don't think there's enough discussion on Who's the worst guy on the mic in wrestling? I think uh, old Sean Waltman is a pretty good contender. This one in particular wasn't terrible, but every time he's on the mic, I'm just waiting for it to unravel. But yeah, I don't know. Thoughts on six here? I'm with I'm with you on that. Like, um, I honestly, again, another guy that I just wasn't a big fan of was was Waltman at this point in the six character. Wasn't a big fan of that. Mm-hmm. Um, I loved him as X-Pac when he was back in DX. One, two, three, kid always is a good story with him. But this version, I don't know, just wasn't clicking for me. Um, mm-hmm. I know he he was their buddy and stuff like that. And then, yeah, it was not good days on the mic. And and depending on if he was clean or not, too, that was the other side of it, right? But uh, Yeah. Do you remember his promo when he debuted on Nitro? Yeah. When he was, like, in the front row. <laughs> <laughs> it was yeah. the first time I had seen it and I saw it recently and it was like, yeah, to your point, how clean is he? Probably not that clean, but yeah. And that's just, that's how he was introduced to the audience. And he was kind of in that position. I felt like from then on out. So, um, but he's here facing Chris Jericho, another guy who's recently debuted. So we got like two really talented guys and just like very weird iterations of their characters. Mm -hmm. So it's like the talent's there, but like character wise, I don't think it really lined up, but um, the match was fine for what it was. I do think more of the story here. I think this match is almost more of a platform to get over Nick Patrick. Yeah. I mentioned that. Yeah. Um, But I mean, the match itself was good. You got to kind of get the classic stuff from both these guys, but yeah, I mean, I thought it was a solid match, kind of a, Forgettable match. You could definitely feel like they have more in the tank here, but I don't know. What'd you think about this one? Yeah. Well, a couple of things that stood out for me. One, uh, I love, and, and my wife was still there and we were chatting about this too. So it's 96. So we're just at the point that we're getting out of the mullet years and we're graduating <laughs> into the, uh, the full grown long hair years. And you can see some guys about like Nash has got this beautiful flowing mane, you know, mm-hmm. Paul has still got a bit of the mullet going on, but Six was like literally right in between. He had he had the long hair in the yeah. back, and then he was grown out the front, but it was parted in the middle. He, he looked like um, you know Inigo uh, uh, Montoya from, uh, yeah, yeah. from Princess Bride, <laughs> Princess but Bride, you know. Yeah. And so there's different people with different styles of hair at this point in time. But yeah, that was kind of funny. The other thing that stood out to me was, um, you know, here we go. You got Jericho, who I don't know, legit probably is about six foot two twenty. You know jacked at this point mm-hmm. there 
six, although a leaner guy was, I think, six one in real life. And these two guys are considered cruiserweights at this point, right? You know, compared yeah. to, uh, you know, today's wrestlers, like they, they, well, we see Jericho in AEW, like they're they're big guys compared to today's guys, and this is what it was like back then. These guys were cruiserweights, and they were, you know, they were flying around that ring pretty good. And, um, mm-hmm. You know, definitely two different styles. Um, I can give and take the amount of karate that we see with the with the six style stuff, right? Because it just I I don't know something. I I think he does know karate, but for some reason, all those movements he does look like somebody who doesn't know karate. Yeah, exactly. It's like a guy who's who's pretending to know karate. (laughs) Yeah, it's like he's doing kung fu fighting dance or something like that. But. But yeah, and the other thing I wrote down, uh, same as you, that you could tell we're getting over the fact that, you know, Nick Patrick is a dirty referee and he's going to be a big factor in this show. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And uh, yeah, to your point, I mean, these guys are flying around the ring, a lot of kicks, um, but ultimately, so Jericho hits the lion salt onto six and then locks in a pin, but Nick Patrick makes a slow count and only gets to one which prompts a lot of booze from the crowd and commentaries going off. Like, oh, he's, I think he's counting slow. And then they're like trying to compare, you know, when Jericho pins and when six pins and then uh, six eventually hits a spinning kick, makes the pin and Nick Patrick counts uh, pretty fast. Not like egregiously fast, but yeah, definitely it wasn't, faster it wasn't than crazy fast. <laughs> it's not like fast enough to be like, oh, you screwed him. But it's yeah. like, oh, he, maybe he got his because. I mean, and I've talked about it before. Nick Patrick's pin cadence just drives me fucking crazy. The way it's almost like he's trying to keep the pin count a secret to the audience. Like <laughs> he's like, sometimes he doesn't even touch the mat. It feels like, and he's just like wagging his wrist unnecessarily. Yeah. It just, I don't know. He's got heat with me on that front, but um, yeah. So long story short, Patrick screws out Jericho of the win and Jericho chases him out. But um we're only we're only getting started with Nick Patrick and his uh, shenanigans on this show. And I, I can't remember if it was during this match or what match, but you know I'm always a sucker for some good uh, Dusty Rhodes um, commentary, and especially when Bobby Heenan's there with him. But I I forget which match it was, but he was going on about somebody's credentials, and he was just laying them out there, and then Heenan repeats them like basically verbatim. <laughs> Dusty's like. I just said that. Weren't you here listening? <laughs> and he was like, yeah, but I just said them in English. <laughs> like, it, just, it just popped me when I heard that. Like just some of the things that like I, I miss about commentators having oh, that man. banter back and forth. Right. Dude. Yeah. It's, I mean, we could do a whole episode just on the commentary and things they said on this show. It was just even yeah. Tony, like his deadpan, like oh, reaction, Tony. the dusty and Heenan is like, yeah. Um, it was like, I don't remember what match it was. I think it was DDP and Eddie where DDP like throws Eddie in the air and Eddie does a nosedive into the mat. And then Tony's like, oh, he did a nosedive into the mat. And then Dusty's like, hey, nosedived. He nosedived into the mat. He says it like four times. <laughs> and Tony's like, yep. All right. Say it again. Say it again, Dusty. One more time. All right. It's, just like, it's kind At of insane he, nowadays, too. He described it as woolly bully was one of the terms that he came up with. He used that throughout the night. Mm, <laughs> like, yeah. oh, and then he goes yeah. on to define what that means. And him and mm-hmm. Tony have a thing. It's <laughs> whatever they had to do to entertain themselves. That was probably during the pretty uh, much Jarrett and giant match. So they probably, probably to, was. Yeah. Sometime. It might've been that. Yeah. <laughs> well, we move on to Arn Anderson versus Lex Luger. So uh, no NWO implications in this match, which um, kind of like got me wondering, like, do you think WCW is too heavy on the NWO at this point? Because it almost feels like if NWO isn't a factor, like it doesn't matter as much. And that's kind of what I got here. Like, even like the motivations behind this match are kind of convoluted. I don't know. What do you think? It, it, to me, it felt like there was not a lot of heat to this one. I agree. Like they were balls deep into NWO at this point, right? Like they just, if it it felt like yeah i agree like if it wasn't nwo it didn't matter except for maybe that first match like the because it was just so good with, with right. dean and, and ray but some of the some of the main event guys just felt kind of unless they're playing off an nwo guy they're kind of lost and shuffle and and honestly i kind of get that because it seems like 
they were trying to go with that angle, like everybody should band together and fight off the NWO because they're trying to take over things. So why the heck are you feuding with each other at this point? It should just be guns and plays at NWO. Aside from like, say like the cruiserweight division, something like that, where they kind of their own identity and they weren't really messing around with that. Um, if you were a main event person, it, mm-hmm. it felt like you weren't important unless you were feuding with the NWO. So this match kind of lost some steam as far as Lex and Aaron, although two guys that I really like and enjoy seeing, but even just the match didn't feel like it had any consequence to it. It was, yeah. that was a problem. I mean, can we talk about right off the get go though, Lex's hair at the, at, during this it, promo they did for it? Describe his hair. <laughs> I would describe it as burnt cotton candy is what <laughs> <I> would, <laughs> that went through a wind tunnel. <laughs> did he just like cut it and like not straighten it? Is that the deal? Like what? I don't Cause, know. Because I, I think at was, this point he had like the ponytail going. Yeah. But he kind of just let it roam free here. And it was just, uh, it's like his hair was blowing in the wind, but yeah. there was no wind. So there was no answer, my friends, either. Um, <laughs> it, yeah, it, it was like one peroxide bottle too many, and it's the and the hair was done. But it's Lex, whatever. We'll, we'll no, I mean way. he was glistening. That, that's I will <laughs> never hate that. I'll that will never get a thumbs down from me. No, I was a big fan <laughs> of the the moisture in this match, if nothing else. But um. <laughs> Yeah, it was, you know, it wasn't a bad match, you know, mechanically it was good. Always love yeah. watching Arn in there. Lex is good. Um, but yeah, to your point, it's just like not a lot of stakes here. And like, I don't know, the motivation behind this match is kind of NWO related, but it's all, it's like yeah. a, just another layer removed from it. Like, I believe because at Fall Brawl, the, the horsemen came together with Sting and Lex, and then Sting turned his back and walked out. And now Arn's blaming Lex, some well, something along those lines. That's kind of why this match is happening, but it's kind of like a yeah. weak premise it's, to a is. feud. Um, you got the Horsemen and the Dungeon of Dooms here too, and just a lot of you know miscellaneous factions running around that all seem like second fiddle to the NWO. So, um, I mean, the finish was interesting because you have uh, you know a ref bump, of course, and then chairs come into play. Uh, Arn grabs a chair, swings it at Lex, but hits the Slim Jim post. And uh, Lex grabs the chair, hits Arn in the back with it, throws him in the ring, and then locks in the torture rack. Arn submits, but Luger won't let go. So he just keeps racking him, keeps on racking him. And then uh, eventually, I think the horsemen come out to... Make him stop, and then uh, Arn's carried out on a stretcher. So Lex looks like a monster here. Mm-hmm. If nothing else, so coming out of it, it's you know boosting his stock. But um, yeah, overall, is yeah, I could take or leave this match. Yeah, and and I'm with you. Like I I love Arn Anderson, absolutely love him. Any chance getting to watch him wrestle is is a delight. And um, you know, seeing him put the spine buster on Lex, it was just a thing of beauty. Him. I always love the way he sells the uh, attempted DDT and the guy holds the rope and arm just takes a huge bump mm. or something like that. Um, weird how they went with like Lex almost being heelish here, but technically he's not a heel, that kind of thing. Mm. Um, I don't know. Like Lex, like I, I just said, Lex 96, 97 is a great job uh, as far as getting Lex over a big part of it was how, you know, the whole him winning the title and stuff like that. But I, I feel like like the 95 portion of this, I think they missed a little opportunity of having Lex come back and go back into the horsemen at that point where they had yeah. that history. And then you could play off of that. But whatever. I mean, it, it is what it is. But um, yeah, it was just there. It felt like no stakes in this match. And if there's no stakes, what are we watching? Right. No stakes, no meat, no sizzle. That's what they say. Right. Mm-hmm. I don't know mm-hmm. what that means. Uh, but <laughs> Lee Marshall's backstage. A lot of, yeah. lot of sticks to this boy with the Harlem Heat and uh, Colonel Parker and Sister Sherry all backstage. I only noted this because did it feel like everybody was like so close together here? Like they're all like yeah. circling Lee Marshall. Like I need to add like a, a picture of it here because it was just like you need to put a Brazzers logo at the bottom of this because they were just <laughs> so close to him. Like Booker's lips were like in his ear for no reason. Yeah. Yeah. It made me very uncomfortable. Well, we didn't have HD at that point, so they didn't have more room on the picture, right? So they really oh. they, they got squeezed into this box. And I mean, 
Booker and Steve Ray, pretty big guys. I mean, but I, I was saddened because I didn't get to see much of Sherry. I mean, like she was blocked out all the time by, yeah. by Booker or it was, uh, you know, Colonel Parker or whatever. But yeah, that, that was that was a loss on that one. Yeah. Yeah. Shame. Well, we'll get more of them later when they defend their tag team titles. But uh, on the way there, we got a, another tag team match. We got the Horsemen represented by Chris Benoit and Steve Mongo McMichael, of course, accompanied by Deborah and a woman taking on the Faces of Fear, a team of Ming and the Barbarian with Jimmy Hart. So again, we got Horsemen versus Dungeon of Doom here. So two other factions facing off against each other. I think really the source of this is Benoit and Sullivan have beef, which yeah. remind <laughs> yeah. me, where in the timeline are we with uh, old Nancy and uh, her, her, her rendezvous? Do you remember? I believe we are right in the timeline of the affairs are starting at this point, and that's why we're uh-huh. playing into the whole angle here. Uh, yeah. Is that, is that like what's supposed to be the reason they don't like each other? So they decided to professionally work with what they had. It's kind of similar to the Matt mm-hmm. Hardy edge thing, that type of thing. Right. But um, yeah, I, I think the difference was, I think Sullivan and Nancy were on the outs for a little while anyways, in that case mm-hmm. versus like, you know, Matt and Lita were <laughs> quite fresh and all of a sudden edge is doing what he's doing. But yeah, yeah. It, it was, um, yeah, I, I was talking about this with my wife, actually, and I said, like, you know, they, they settled this one in the ring. Let's put it this way. They they agreed to be stiff with each other but not kill each other or, or put either of them out of the business at this point. But uh, well, I, I'll let you get to what happens in the match. This is where I felt the show started to pick up again a little bit because um, of this match and then just anything with Benoit. And I, I'm not one of those people that that's like, oh, God, I can't watch Benoit. I'm sorry. Like, I mm-hmm. he was one of my favorite wrestlers at the time, and watching him work is just, like probably WCW Benoit is my favorite version of Benoit because he's just like a buzzsaw that whole time, right? Yeah. So vicious and work with the horsemen, it worked and all that stuff. And his thing with Nancy too, that worked really well. Um, so yeah, I, you know, in the faces of fear, it's just a joke. Like these guys should be just eating everybody alive. Right? <laughs> I <laughs> love the faces of fear, dude. I yes. mean, it's just, just too big. Tongan? Are they both Tongan? No, Meng's Tongan. What is Barbarian? Is he just tan? He is Tongan as well. Yeah. Is he Tongan? Okay. Yeah. yeah. Two big Tongans just throwing each other, or throwing people around. It's really all I it, need. It, to by the way, thing. is it me or, or was this probably maybe Steve McMichael's best match because it was the best use because he was allowed to just be very physical with these two guys? The chop blocks. Big yeah. Fan. Playing yep. to his football background, which is yep. you know makes sense. I'm surprised we don't see that more often, like from football players, but. Um, yeah, really, by the way, the random sumo battle between Mongo and Ming <laughs> towards the beginning had me. is, is Haku a, a sumo guy, like a former sumo guy. Do you know? He, he, yeah, he did do a little bit of sumo in Japan. Yeah. Well, he looked like it. God damn those hands. Yeah. Intense. They were fast. Yeah. Yeah. He, uh, he beat Mongo in that department, but, um, and then that Ming collision and- that th- that collision they had mid ring um, early in the match where they did the two shoulder blocks and then McMichael jumped in the air and hit him like that was mm. that was some physicality there that was pretty good. This was uh, just a lot of meat slapping. Yes, in this match, which uh, that's all it needed to be. I mean, any any time Ming and Benoit had interactions, chopping each other, just whew, it was just good stuff. And then uh, you know, faces of fear, their double team stuff like. The double head butts from opposite corners, the almost like a power and glory type of move. Yep. Um, I think Ming does like a backdrop. He, no, he, no, Ming backdrops Benoit and then Barbarian catches him into a power bomb, which is just crazy looking. Crazy. Yep. But all of that has nothing um, in comparison to the Halliburton that uh, Mongo is carrying around with him. What's in it? Who knows? But uh, this big metal briefcase to the head of Ming from Mongo, and then Benoit follows it up with a flying headbutt, gets the win. So the horsemen come out, the winners here, and uh, <laughs> a little post-match shenanigans here, to say the least. But match itself I thought was solid. I thought the match was solid. And I thought the beatdown afterwards was pretty solid too, to be quite honest. Like I, I, it felt 
I don't know why it just felt like, man, these guys seem pretty vicious. And I, I kind of feel like this could go off the rails or something. I don't know. They felt kind of real. Cause I think too, I had in my head. I also know what's going on with Sullivan and Ben right. and Nancy. And is he going to get it like a little stiff key, uh, you know, a stiff shot in on, uh, on Benoit at this point. And, and just mm-hmm. him, you know, talking to Nancy and talked about how he's the man still. And Benoit is not the man and all that. Like just. He's undoing his shirt. He's yeah. Like, yeah. What are you thinking yeah. about this? Yeah. It's like just look at all that like. stuff. And, and correct me if I'm wrong. I, and I'm trying to remember back. Is this, this is very, very early stage of gangster Conan too, right? Yeah. We're like a month or two into it. So yeah. Okay. Mm-hmm. A lot of volatile uh, characters. Cause obviously you yeah. got the Benoit Sullivan heat, but then you got these faces of fear guys involved. And then That'll you got Conan you. who's unhinged. Yeah. And then who else is there? I mean, I think that's pretty much it. Right. Who else is in the dungeon at this point? Um, Jimmy Hart's there. Yeah. Too. I think this is when they kind of fleshed out some of the other guys like Tenta and stuff like that. So this felt a bit more. Yeah. Vicious. And, and even Nancy did a great job of selling things like with just begging Jimmy to, to get him to stop and stuff like even that stuff. So I, mm-hmm. I for a beat down, like it, they didn't have to do much, but it, it just had that feel of realism. I enjoyed like, this was a good pick me up. Like as far as like the action and the, and if, it, it, we got away from the silliness, you know, that type of thing. Right. Yeah. And the, the realism for me, cause like, cause they obviously the dungeon, they beat down the horsemen because it's, it's like seven against two or whatever. Yeah. Uh, Mongo's laid out and then Benoit is like still on his feet and I'm yes. watching this. I'm like, is Benoit going to like sell for anybody? <laughs> cause he's I just know. like chopping the shit. I'm like, is he just going to take out the entire dungeon of doom? But eventually, yep. you know, numbers kind of uh, pile up on them and they lay him out. So uh, dungeon looking strong here, which uh, that's a good point. They're kind of getting away from the, like the circus act kind yeah. of thing with all the face yeah. paint and the goofy monstery type stuff and more. Yeah. Cause realism. they had the shark and they had Kamala and the, the leprechaun and all this stuff. And it's like, yeah, yeah this felt like a bit more cohesive crew. Cause uh, I don't know if this is before or after Hugh Morris and stuff like that. Either. I think this is after yeah, Hugh Morris is in the picture. Oh, point, is he yeah. okay? There's your. He might have been out there too. I don't know if he's on this show or not. But I can't remember. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah. So dungeon looking strong. I'm slowly becoming a Dungeon of Doom fan. I hate to say it, but <laughs> if you suffer through '95, you deserve to see some good dungeon because '95 <laughs> dungeon was uh, horrible. Holy. God. What was uh beefcake Zodiac? Zodiac yeah, with the yeah. stupid horn on his ass. Mm. Rough times. Rough yeah. times. Uh. Well, we got the. Tag team titles on the line next. The Harlem Heat, Booker T and Stevie Ray defending against the Outsiders, Kevin Nash and Scott Hall. So uh, at this point, the NWO are 2-0 and on the night and um, going to make trying to make a 3-0 and here and also taking the titles. I actually really enjoyed this match a lot more than I thought I would. Um, mm-hmm. I think we're still in this period where Nash and Hall are still pretty good workers at this point. I mean, you know, Diesel and Razor Ramon were doing really good stuff at the end of their WWF runs. Yep. And, you know, we're still not too far from that. So there was some good work in this match. They were like, like Harlem Heat got a lot of offense in this match, which is like yep. at this point, the NWO was kind of bulletproof. So it was interesting seeing them just like getting thrown around. Like I think at one point, Stevie Ray just like tosses like Gorilla Presses, Scott Hall and Kevin Nash, and they both go down. So um, no, I actually this is probably one of the top matches of the night for me. Overall, even it's kind of a weird finish, but um, I enjoyed it. What about you? Yep, um, I'm with you. Same thing. I like they these two teams meshed well. Is what I'll is what I'll say. Um, yeah. I felt like Hall and Nash both had their working boots on uh, for this match. Mm-hmm. Probably more so Hall because Nash just had to come in and just be the big guy. But even when Nash was doing his stuff, it was stiff. You know, it looked good and. Um, and he had an aura to him. The fans were like so behind these guys, which, mm-hmm. but almost it was weird. Like they were really behind them, but also they wanted to be behind Harlem Heat because they just garner some respect too, because they're just two badass dudes, you know, like they're mm-hmm. just so good. And I mean, you know, it's funny just saying like, I don't look retroactively at Ben and just, I can't watch him. But when I watch Scott Hall, I think, oh, man, one, that guy was so cool it was beyond belief and so good at what he did and i've said this on other podcasts too like i've never seen a guy 
that is so big that's able to, when he needs to, make himself look small, but not weak. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like he could sell, like his selling for a big man was out of this world. Like I wish he was around today. Like say like if AEW hired him or something and Mm -hmm. took guys like Wardlow and stuff like that and said, okay, go talk to Scott about how you should sell as a guy of your size because he doesn't give, he doesn't all of a sudden just, become meek and mild he just sells in a way that a big man should sell and right. um and, and but doesn't lose his aura or his presence and it's just yeah th- this was probably peak of the outsiders being i don't know i can't say they were clean at this point but they were not messing up getting themselves messed up for the matches at this point is what i'll say like they were still i think they were both in the mindset like we're gonna make a whole lot of money with this so let's just do what we gotta do for right it. Yeah. And this, this is really like their first because on the nitros, they don't really have like matches. You know, they yeah. have beatdowns and schmozzy kind, kind, of, kind of stuff. So it's like, okay, this is our opportunity to really like have a good match here. And then I'm sure they respected the Harlem Heat. So yeah. Yeah. They messed really well to your point. And uh, yeah, I mean, Scott Hall, I mean, he has like some of the best punches oh, in wrestling. They're, <laughs> they're beautiful. So good. Beautiful. They're so loud. Yeah. They look good. And Nash's like knees in the corner and his elbows, they just have an intensity to him. I mean, it's really Booker always looks like he's going to take your Booker looks like he's going to take your head off with that. Um, that what do you call it? Like it's a reverse kick or whatever, like yeah. that spinning heel kick or whatever. It's just and his Harlem hangover is just ridiculous. <laughs> how how yeah. deadly that looks, man. <laughs> like it's just he hits yeah. it in this match, and it was like on the replay. You can see how Hall's head just got crushed or got close yeah. to getting crushed. It was beautiful and brutal. It just pretty much Booker T's MO here. And uh, mm-hmm. um, there's a fun spot in this match where Scott Hall spits in the face of Stevie Ray. And Stevie's like staring at him coldly. And then Hall tags in Nash. And then Nash eventually gets knocked down by Stevie. And then Stevie turns the hall and spits in his face. So there's an element of like, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> this is the just genuine, like palpable animosity between these two, which is awesome. Pretty um, sure this is the uh, match we get the spooky fingers meme from too for Scott Hall. Yes, I noticed that. The yeah, yeah, everybody yeah. knows. Mm-hmm. Um, also, by the way, apparently Colonel Parker is a cuck, which I uh, <laughs> wasn't familiar with until this match. Uh, so. <laughs> Obviously, Sherry and Parker are out there with Harlem Heat. At some point, Sherry just slaps the shit out of Scott Hall. And then Hall, because it's the 90s, you react to this by grabbing her by the hair and kissing her against her will. Um, And then Parker just sits there and does nothing. He has a cane Mm -hmm. in his hand. He could have, you know, hey, come on. Enough of the malarkey. But he's like, well, oh, well, I guess you're going to get your kiss. Or whatever. Um, (laughs) So... So that happens, and then Harlem Hangover is hit by Booker T onto Scott Hall, but then if a ref, I don't know, he's sleeping somewhere, and then Nash, or Parker gets in the ring with his cane, but then Nash takes the cane away from Parker and then hits, I think it's Stevie Ray with it, breaks the cane, Hall pins him, new tag team champions, the Outsiders. So I think it was inevitable at this point. Seems like we're building the story of them taking over and a lot you know, that's based on them taking the titles and this is another another piece to the puzzle here. But yeah, new champs here and overall just a pretty entertaining little match here. Yeah, my only complaint about the match would probably be that ending only because it took too long to do the whole grabbing the cane thing, hitting. Uh, yeah, I think yeah. it was Stevie Ray. And it's like Booker was with the referee, like getting put out of the ring for like ever. And I mean, mm-hmm. it's. Uh, that was the only thing that I would say. Other than that, everything else was great in this one. Yeah, there's a lot of cooks in the kitchen. Two managers. Yep. You got a referee's in the corner. He's dead, but he's alive again. The cane didn't break on the first shot. So you had to hit him a few times. It was a little clunky, but yeah, it is what it is. But, but then Hall <laughs> sells it perfectly. He sells it like he's dead from that Harlem hangover, which he might have been, actually, because it was pretty, pretty <laughs> nasty looking. <laughs> it was uh, pretty stiff. Yeah. yeah, it took a little bit to cover him. He had to like muster up the just getting the one arm over, which is yeah, little things. Scott Hall's so things. good, man. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, you want to talk clunky? <laughs> it's time for our main event, folks. We got the uh, what the NWO World Title on the line. 
We got Hollywood Hogan taking on Macho Man Randy Savage. We are a long ways away from the mega powers exploding, <laughs> is what I was thinking watching this. It just feels like a completely different... Uh, I mean, I don't even know where to begin. I mean, Hogan... Hogan looks like a fucking dildo here, first of all. I mean, what, what are we? What are we? Is this the hair that he had in one of his stupid movies? Yeah, I... I um. First thing I wrote was, oh my fucking God, I forgot Hogan had a rug on for this match, which was, <laughs> oh, yeah, I think he wore it for either the Three Ninjas movie or whatever, Santa with Muscles. Santa with Muscles. Something. Yeah, yeah. And I mean, Have you seen Hogan's, any of those? No, no. Uh, no holds Nobody barred. Has. It's my only venture into Hogan's uh, <laughs> acting ability. But, um, and uh, the other thing was Hogan was like so slimmed down at this point because he had been doing the, the acting and stuff mm-hmm. like that. And uh, just it just seemed weird, but yeah, that that rug. Oh my good god! <laughs> yeah, because I was my wife was sitting next to me watching this, and she looks up and she's like, "Who's that?" And I'm like, "It's Hulk Hogan." And she just like she couldn't even like put that together. Like what? Because mm-hmm. he had the stupid glasses, like he was like the fourth member of Too Cool, and then he had <laughs> the 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 rug. It was like Sting hair, kinda. And now, can we talk long- about the? Can we talk about the fact he he wears a rug? But of all the rugs he could wear, he wears one that still gives him a receding hairline. <laughs> yeah, you, know, you, you, you get a five head ball. with this. Right? <laughs> you know? And it's like the headband he was wearing was a little too low. Yes, the spray yeah. painted black beard. The, the he was so skinny, like you said. The it was mustache just a weird wasn't look. grown in. The mustache wasn't fully yeah. grown in either because it had been shaved by Kevin Sullivan. So, yeah. That just didn't look like Hogan at all until no, <laughs> eventually got ripped off. But It looked like Dallas Buyers Club Hogan. Yeah. <laughs> HIV Hogan in the house. <laughs> um, yeah, so. And that's not even. So Hogan's here. He cuts a promo and the crowd eventually comes to the ring. And uh, by the way, Michael Michael Buffer stupid Michael Buffer starts introducing Hogan before Macho Man comes out, which it's, it's all disconjointed. Yeah. And then Macho Man starts coming out. They like play his music and they stop this music to introduce Hogan and they play it again. And then Macho Man comes out and then he goes to the side of the stage to beckon out a monster truck, but it takes 18 years for this monster truck to come out. I don't know if yeah. it's stalled or what the hell, but it comes Tokyo drifting out there. Macho Man monster truck with the hat and the Slim Jim logo. Commentary is like, is this what the fan won? I was just like, I hope not. What a pain in the ass that would be to have that in your driveway. Have to have a driveway to fit that thing. Have to get the gas. It's the whole thing. Poor Joan. Old 70-year-old Joan trying to climb up onto the wheel oh. to get into the... <laughs> just kidding. Corn oh, by Macho Man. Yeah. Thanks for hating on Michael Buffer, because if there's somebody I want to reach through my TV and grab and choke, it's oh. Michael Buffer. Oh, It's just his his long winded introductions just drive me crazy. And how much money did they spend on that guy, too, which is really scary? I mean, they probably have to pay a couple a uh, couple mil just for him to say ready to rumble. So, yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. I'll come in with the orange tights with the silver trim. He's he filed his taxes jointly, just unnecessary like details about each guy. And I don't know, <laughs> doesn't add anything to it. But then you got that. You got stupid Hogan with his uh, even Hogan's The match eventually starts. And then Hogan's like running around the ring. I will say, though, Hogan's do, he is playing a good heel here, which is, he is. chicken. Shit very, heel. Yeah, it reminds me of when Stone Cold turned heel uh, WrestleMania 17. And then he had to transition from this badass world beater into like a cowardly heel, like, oh, no, like begging off in the corner. It's like it's kind of in the same vein where it's like very, it's like so opposite of what he used to be. But I thought he, he played it off well. I mean, you know, begging all like getting on his knees. like, Oh, please don't. Please don't kind of stuff. So. um, But yeah, the match is what it is. I mean, Macho Man takes off the wig and glasses at some point and <laughs> puts it on, which is a hilarious visual. It actually looked uh, better on Macho Man. Yeah, it made more sense on him, for sure. <laughs> Exposing Hogan's dumb ponytail that he had to tie up to fit in this wig. It's just, um, 
chairs getting involved. We got to see Hogan's ass. What do you think about his ass? How do you rate you know, it out of 10? I don't know. Hogan was what? How old at this point? He was, uh, he was born probably in younger 50- than you think. He was born in 53. So he would have been 43 at this point. Is, are, first of all, I don't know why you just know his birthday offhand. Well, um, I mean, I just literally did a video on Hulk Hogan <laughs> okay. on my channel not that long ago. So yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. So 43 year old ass. I mean, he was in good shape. I'll, I'll say this. He, yeah. He was down probably 30 pounds from his usual weight that he is um, wrestling at, but he was ripped though. I'll say that. Like when, when they actually, when Macho pulled the tights down, you could see Hogan's abs. I mean, he was rocking some abs there, so he was in good shape. Wow. But I mean, one thing he, he's not afraid to tan and he, and obviously he, um, he tans everywhere. So, you know, good on him. Good on mm, him. So. Almost everywhere. Not quite his ass. I think he, <laughs> he might got, have missed a couple of cheeks. Well, he, he he got the cheeks. He just had the thong print there. <laughs> What's the problem, right? Yeah. So See, I knew I should have recorded this so we could do the old Telestrator deal on yeah. his ass. But, um, <laughs> you need the Pat, Matt, Pat McAfee Telestrator. But yeah. yeah, maybe. Uh, I'll yeah, that, but yeah, he got some screeches from the girl. So there you go. So good on Hogan. Not bad. I don't like a muscular ass. You know, like John Cena's ass. Have you? He was in um, what was it? The Amy Schumer movie. Mm-hmm. Um, but he, he saw his ass, and it's just like a square. Yeah, there's that's and, that's uh, wrong. Yeah, too much, too much ass. But um, well, regardless of that, um, uh, that's not even the beginning of the shenanigans here because no, no, I'm, I wish we could stick to Hogan's ass to be quite honest, but <laughs> we can't. <laughs> so feel free to like. I tried to take notes on this. There was just so much happening towards the end. So literally my note says so much bullshit in this main event. That's that's yeah. literally my note. Yeah. So Ted DiBiase's ringside with Hogan. He hands Hogan some sort of object, which is it like a pipe? Did you get a the commentary was, was just like, oh, he's, he's he has some sort of object. I thought it was a rolled up piece of paper myself, but <laughs> It's always like so cartoony, like even like yeah. brass knuckles are always like these big white things. So you can, I don't yeah. know. Um, I, I guess in my head, it's like a small pipe and uh, Hogan takes the pipe. Eh, pause. Hogan takes the pipe and uh, Liz, <laughs> by the way, Miss Elizabeth is out there. And that's yeah. a whole other element of this thing, because Liz had been with the horsemen. And the horseman and Macho Man had been at odds, and Liz had been using all the alimony money from Macho Man to pay for whatever the fuck. And uh, new boobs, so, apparently. Oh, were there new boobs? I didn't really notice. Kind of looked like it. That's my wife actually mentioned that. She's like, "Did she get a boob job?" Mm, <laughs> so again, and we'll the women, to, the women know, the women know, right? So I'll have to add the visual here so we can compare. Um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, so Liz and Macho had obviously been at odds, but. Liz has seen Macho get beat down by the NWO and she's like, well, I still have feelings for you. And there's a whole dramatic, you know, build up and the Nitro's leading up to this. Like Macho doesn't know if he can trust her. He catches Liz in the hotel room of the NWO, but Liz is trying to like, it's not what it seems. It's a whole thing. Mm-hmm. But Liz is out here. And uh, she she takes the pipe away from Hogan. And then Hogan eventually lays out the referee. And then Macho Man hits the elbow from the top, makes the pin count. One, two. Uh, Nick Patrick, by the way, is, is in as the new referee. One, two. Oh, my neck. Oh, I can't make, the, I can't make that last count. So Nick Patrick again, uh, screwing the pooch here, so to speak. And then uh, Macho Man eventually grabs this object from Hogan, hits him with it. But then Ted DiBiase gets involved and the Giants back out here. And then the Giant choke slams Macho on the floor, rolls him in. Hogan covers him. And then Nick Patrick as now his neck is healed. So now he can count to three. <laughs> and so Hogan retains the title. And uh, yeah, just a very cluster ending stretch here. And I can be... I don't always hate like these type of finishes, but just the way I don't know, it didn't really move me how this one played out too much. There was just too much, too much yeah. in there. It was just a cluster that choke slam might have been the gentlest choke slam I've ever seen in my entire life, considering it was on a padded floor as well. Well, um, so it made me laugh because giant grabs macho man, like on the side where the stage is of the ring. 
of, I don't think there was padding on that side of the floor. So you see Giant look down, see that there's no padding. So he like throws Macho Man into the barricade to like shift him to another side of the ring and then choke slams him on the pad. So and yeah, yeah too lays him down gently there. Yeah. Um, yeah. And then, yeah, it, it was just too much. The, ridiculous. Uh, like, I, I mean, I'm a, you know, a big Macho Man Hogan fan, but it was, yeah, they, they didn't need all this. They could have had a, fine match with just maybe DiBiase mm-hmm. interfering and distracting referee and away you go, right? Yeah. Too many hats on hats. You could have just had one hat. Um, one wig. But but I will I will say this. If I could trade it for not having what happened next, I would <laughs> take even more interference. <laughs> well, after the match, Hogan starts cutting a promo. Who cares what he's saying? Uh, and the bagpipes start to play folks and no 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 it's not drew mcintyre it's rowdy roddy piper comes out debuting in wcw comes out to the ring grabs well he doesn't grab a mic he has a mic in his jacket and then uh begins to say things he says uh he's i don't even know he's just rambling Says that he's the one guy that Hogan can't beat, which is that true? Did he not beat him at the you know, first WrestleMania? No. Well, he he won the tag team match, but he didn't pin Piper, right? It was Orton mm. who got pinned. Yeah. That's right. That's right. So I guess there's a, a source to this, but uh, I don't know. Hogan's like just, just exaggerated and cartoony. Like, oh my God. He's like hiding behind Giant. It's like, dude, <laughs> I think you, I think you got. I think you can handle Piper here, but I think so. um, Just a train wreck of a promo. I can't even tell you what they talked about. Well, you knew. Okay. Well, here's the thing too. Like I am a Piper fan and I'm for my channel currently watching early eighties, mid Atlantic championship wrestling. When you have Roddy Piper at his peak before he even goes to the WWF and uh, just solid gold on the microphone for this stuff. But this promo was just all over the place. Even Hogan was looking at him going, all right, Piper, let's just wrap it up. He tried to, he mm-hmm. tried to cut him off a couple of times just to move things along. And Piper's like, no, let me speak and all this. And it just meandered and went nowhere. And basically even Hogan, I, I, I don't even know if that was scripted that Hogan was supposed to say, you're just as good as me. But I think Hogan's like, all right, we got to just get this show off the air. So I'm just yeah. going to say this, you know, just so bad. Except the only good thing was the line Hogan laid on him was he, when he was getting out of the ring when he told him that uh, when he goes to the washroom he should squat or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's yeah, both guys were trying to cut each other off. They weren't working together on this thing. It didn't seem like there was a plan. Um, but I guess we're building to a match between these two guys, which I'm sure will be great. I'm sure it's oh, going to be five stars. Y- yes, I remember this one clearly and you're going to love it. I can't wait. Mm-hmm. I can't wait. Um, is that is that the one where Macho Man jumps off the cage? This is the main is event it? of Starcade, is what this is going to be. And a nine right. title match, too. So, Ugh, Of course it is. Why wouldn't it be? Because Piper um, will not lay down for Hogan's. So. <laughs> <laughs> what, what a and, good recipe. Mm-hmm. It's not yeah. the butcher, at least in the main event of Starcade. <laughs> but, you know. Yeah. Brother Brood Eye. I don't know which one I'd prefer, but um, or the disciple or whatever the fuck he is at this point. Yeah. So, well, the show ends mid promo. Tony's yes. like, all right, sorry, folks, we got to wrap it up. But I don't think anybody really cared. So, like you said, it was it was going nowhere and uh, really made you want to turn into Nitro the next night, I guess. Right. I, I wonder how much longer the promo went on after they cut them off. Like, I think it they... might still be going on, to be honest. <laughs> I got, I got to say it might still be going on, but that was, uh, that's some havoc for you. Halloween havoc 96. If you had, uh, if you had to throw a grade at this from a to F, what do you think you would throw at it? I'm going to give it, I'm going to be generous and give it a C plus, uh, yeah. you know, uh, middle of the road, but there was enough high quality stuff on there. Like I'm just looking back at it. Like Malenko Mysterio was great. DDP and Guerrero was great. Uh, uh, yeah. Giant Jeff Jarrett wasn't so much. Six and Jericho was not too bad. 
um, Luger and Anderson, two stars, just didn't have a lot of heat to it. Mm-hmm. The tag, the two tag team matches were fantastic. The Hogan Savage match, if it didn't have so much fuckery in it, it would have been much better. But it just it wasn't. And then the whole Piper thing just kind of ruined it. So honestly, yeah. it was uh, like I say, it was like a roller coaster. It was great. Then you went down, and then you went back up, and then you got to this part, and that was. So I'll say C plus in my in my books. Yeah, I was thinking the same thing. I think that Piper promo took it down a half a letter grade for me. But yeah, um, yeah, I agree. There's not like any like terrible matches on this card. It does feel like it's NWO is like the only story going on, which it is a good story. But there's like a, like a lack of depth, I would say, on this. But you have the cruiserweight match here in the beginning. So there's some good stuff on this. I mean, we're it's you compare this to like the prior year's Halloween Havoc. I mean, it's night and day, so. Um, but it's a lot to wrestle with. But uh, speaking about wrestling with, where can uh, where can everybody find you, listen to you, and uh, taste your delicious voice? <laughs> well, I, I honestly, I've been pretty naughty because I haven't been putting too much stuff out lately. I don't know. I think I've, I think I've gotten into depression because I went back onto Twitter, and that was probably my biggest mistake ah, I could possibly do. <laughs> that'll do it. Holy God, that place is just a minefield of mental health issues. Like, it's just unbelievable. I, actually, I, I appreciate like you being on there because you're the one guy that I see calling this stuff out and actually making some comedy out of it. So it's good. But, <laughs> oh, my God. Like, I, I, I swear to God, that started to depress me, all the stuff that's on there. But, yeah, if people want to want to find me, it's mostly on YouTube. It's um, Wrestling with the 80s on YouTube is uh, the, the main stuff that I'm doing. Obviously, I'm a old guy i like 80s wrestling i really enjoy it and uh just concentrating on that era of wrestling i'm um i'm about to embark i think what the next thing will be is um in my watching i'm going i've been going back like the early years and finished 82 and 83 now i'm going to start with mm-hmm. 84 so i think i'm doing that's when the golden era of wrestling really starts so i'm going to just do a little almost like as if somebody was watching it in real time, you know, and just kind of do mm-hmm. a podcast like that. Um, I do have wrestling with the truth as well. It's, it's, um, the audio podcast it's on and off. If I get inspired enough to rant about modern wrestling, I will. And I'll oh, go yeah. off on that a little bit. Um, but you know, it's, it's, I can't guarantee it's going to be a every week type of thing, but you know, every once in a while, or just go to the back catalog. There's some good stuff there and just, you know, uh, enjoy the rants, but, um, I might get back into that a little bit too, because, um, I think I'm starting to clear the haze of the depression of Twitter you know, <laughs> because I'm sick and tired of seeing people quote unquote, getting canceled and all this stuff. Then they're getting mm. canceled by people who completely contradict themselves and stuff like that. I've started using the block button a lot more, not just for people Ooh. who say anything to me. It's more so if I see something stupid, you're blocked. I don't care. You're just blocked. It's just, I don't need that in my life and that's starting to make it a bit more clean now. Yeah. It's, it's a, a minefield is an understatement. I mean, I, I, I'm trying to mute and block people too, but it, I mean, yeah. these, these diva stands just, it feels like they're coming oh. out the woodwork. <laughs> oh my God. Like it's just, it's beyond it's, it's, I, I don't understand how like they're obviously, like, like I said, it's day on somebody else's. Um, I um, made a comment on their, uh, on their YouTube and I'm like, it's either these people don't exist or they're intentionally doing this just to try to get people riled up or they literally are mentally deranged and they want to see wrestling just go away or something like that. But it just, there's no rhyme or reason for what's going on. Like, it's just crazy. But I, I, I don't know if, if you want to interact with me, you're probably better off going to Instagram and find me there. It's, it's either at wrestling with the eighties or at wrestling with the truth that I find people are a bit more, um, uh, yeah. a bit more normal there but yeah twitter is just a, a are you on field. threads no i'm not I mean, i've been thinking about shifting the threads maybe that's better i know it's like instagram it's like their twitter maybe threads maybe maybe we kick up myspace again get that going that's that's what i want myspace give it a second good, try yeah. but then you have the top eight again then that causes a whole a whole other debacle you can't you yeah escape the drama man i don't know it's just crazy like i i, I I don't know about you, but I, I can't even give like an honest opinion on stuff. Like, I, like even with groups of friends, like if I say something like literally asking a question about AEW where I go, like, this didn't really make sense to me. Like, can you explain this? It's like, <laughs> it's causing a kerfuffle. Like, okay, guys, it's, it's, 
it's effing wrestling. We just sat through a 20 minute Roddy Piper promo that went nowhere. And we watched the <laughs> giant, uh, you know, against Jeff Jarrett. Like, I think you can withstand us saying, well, maybe Will Ospreay shouldn't have got seven stars in that match. You know, but, I yeah. think, I think most people's anger would get uh neutered. If they just watch some WCW, watch, Ooh. watch some, watch some dungeon of doom. It'll cool you down a little bit. You watch 95 WCW and you will never, ever complain about anything ever again. <laughs> watch like, a renegade match. and uh, oh, <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. Renegade match, the whole Hogan versus Dungeon of Doom, um, how they, Ugh. what the stuff they did to Flair and stuff like that. Yeah. Like just, that's, that's fine. You'll, you'll go, you know what? I appreciate what we have today. <laughs> yeah. What are your thoughts on Jim Duggan? Okay, here's here's something for you. Um, no, uh, I'm literally like like say watching early '80s, uh, mid south, and that stuff. If you want to appreciate Jim Duggan, go watch that. He honestly was fantastic in mid south in '82, '83, '84. That stuff. He mm-hmm. honestly he should have been huge, um, and I think he really was going to be huge in WWF. But then he got caught with the Iron Sheik and doing the you know, not only you know getting caught in kayfabe, but then also it was a drug bust and that screwed everything over mm-hmm. for him. But yeah, WCW Jim Duggan was just it was a clown show. But if you watch, uh, I tell anybody watch Mid South eighty two eighty three. You want to see a guy that's over. Like Jim Duggan was over. He was a badass. He looked huge, like against these people. He was tough. Mm. His promos were good. All that stuff. Yeah, it's good stuff. I'm making it my mission to try to become a fan of him, but I'm, all I've seen is the taped fists yeah. and the stupid tongue and his stupid yeah. board and his. But well, maybe next time we'll, we'll get up here and do a, a Jim Duggan retrospective. I mean, you can even see it if you look at like. 87 88 wwf you could tell like they were actually trying to do something with him and then boom he got that drug bust and that was it but yeah and then he became just the clown prince of wrestling with the the tongue and the board and the hose and the usa and all this stuff and then i think he was just collecting a paycheck in wcw and god bless him you might as well get it right but if you want to cleanse your palate of jim duggan watch mid south on peacock and watch him and dibiase together fantastic stuff mm. jim duggan has hose huh that's all i heard out of that he does yeah well, well, can and, you blame and he's got a board he's got a stiff board too so <laughs> <laughs> once again thank you to bc for joining me on this lovely lovely episode go give him a follow wrestling with the 80s wrestling with the truth youtube audio taste he has a taste podcast where you just Put them in your mouth. I don't fucking know. Go do all that stuff. Hey! Let's hit that jangle, baby. Okie dokie artichokey. Let's uh, let's get into this bad boy, huh? Hardest promotion. If you're on YouTube, I will um, walk you through it. But basically, we are looking at WWF, WCW, ECW. Comparing the companies. We got a lot of different criteria we're going to look at. In ring, out of ring macro stuff micro stuff best and the worst we'll get into it we'll get into all the points and whatnot first of all let's give an overview of where we're at in the standings and now we're in around october of 96 towards the tail end of october so we're getting towards the end here just a few more shows um but as the standings are right now wwf is in the lead with 13 points WCW is currently in second with five points and ECW is pulling up the rear with four points. So we'll see if anything changes there. But first things first, let's grade this pay-per-view, shall we? So now I, I, we talked at the end of the uh, at the end of the uh, episode there. where we, we were both saying like C, C plus kind of thing. And I think I still um, maintain that. Where the fuck is there? It is uh, Halloween Havoc. I think a C, right? Because we're, we're, we're ranking this, by the way, of course. Uh, scale of S to F. S being one of the best shows of all time. F being a show where I'd rather uh, fuck an anthill than, uh, than watch. So 
Uh, Halloween Havoc, I think, is good as a C territory show. Or is it a B? Is it a B? It's a good question. And I've mentioned it before. I think next year we're going to switch this to a, uh, a numerical <laughs> scale, which I think would be a better representation. But we're already we're already balls deep into this bad boy. So I think either C or B. I'm leaning towards C+. Plus. I think C plus is a good call. Because we gave In Your House 10 a B. We gave Fall Brawl an A. Hmm. Fall Brawl having an A makes me think we throw a B at this bad boy, like a B minus, because I don't think Fall Brawl was like dramatically better than this show. Um, you know what? I'm gonna throw a B at it. I'm feeling I'm feeling generous today. Let's throw a B at Halloween Havoc. It was like I said, no terrible matches. Yeah, the NWO story is red hot. And even though that may have taken away from other stories going on, I think there was enough good to uh, to throw a B at this bad boy. We'll throw a B at it. So we move over here. Now we look at each of the promotions and see which one has the highest average grade so far. Currently, WWF still maintains the lead here at about a C plus being the average. So we go over to the overall scoreboard. And uh, I forget if I mentioned this already, but if you're on YouTube, I'm sharing my screen and you can visually um, look at all this stuff. So WWF still maintains the highest average grade. So they keep those six points. So no change there. Best pay-per-view of the year. Still WrestleMania 12, which had an A. Fall Brawl had a B. So, of course, that would not be the best show of the year. So no change there. WCW Super Brawl, still the worst of the year uh, with an F. So no changes in that realm. Uh, moving on to in-ring. So now we're just talking about the general in-ring product that each of these companies are presenting. Currently, we are tracking WWF as the best overall. Hmm. Very interesting. I'll tell you one thing about WCW when we talked about this in the episode. Their finishes to their matches are dog shit, dude. <laughs> like, almost to the point where they, like, I wouldn't say they ruin the matches, but they definitely take them down a peg a little bit. You know what I'm saying? It, there's, like, that climax, but then it's, like, instead of, like, it's like if you're on a roller coaster. Like, you're if you're on a roller coaster, you get to the top of it, you want to have, a, like, a nice, fun path down to the end. WCW is, like, that, but... It's like Roller Coaster Tycoon when you take away some of the tracks and the roller coaster goes high, but it gets shoots up into the air and then falls and plummets to the ground into a fireball. That's kind of what WCW is. So uh, that's a long winded way of saying I think WWF still has the better overall. In ring product, especially with like Bret Hart's coming back, you still got Sean doing really great stuff We're we're fresh off of mind games. The Sean Mankind stuff. Yeah, I got Mankind and Taker still doing their deal. Owen Hart's around the Mark Marrows. Um, a lot of good talent over there. The tag team division's even pretty decent. So I think WWF still maintains the best in ring for now. So they keep that four points. Best match, Sean Diesel in your house seven. Um, <clears throat> I don't think anything on this show is better than that. I get well, hold on, hold on. Let's uh let's think about this for a second. Um So I would say match of the year or match of the night for uh Halloween Havoc, probably Ray and Dean, right? Was Ray and Dean better than Sean and Diesel? Which is interesting because they're very different matches, right? Very different. You got an opening match for the Cruiserweight title, but the athleticism is, is way more impressive. But then you got Sean and Diesel, which, I mean, there is some athleticism there, especially on the end of Sean. But you have that main event. It's for the world title. The, the, the buildup, the, the feud has intensity to it. There is an intensity with Sean and Diesel that I don't think was matched by Ray and Dean. Maybe. Maybe. See, I'm, I'm kind of just thinking out loud here. You know what I'm saying? that Maybe I'm wrong. Um, 
<sighs> this is tough. It's actually pretty tough. I just really love this Sean Diesel match, man. I think what may push it. Um, I think Sean and Diesel still maintains this. Just for the fact, just the stakes and the spotlight given to this match, the energy of that match. Um, even though the energy of Ray and Dean was great too, I think Sean and Diesel just slightly ekes it out. Slightly. Um, but yeah. Maybe also, you know, just a thought, you know, feel free to uh if you're in the Discord, you know, or if you want to message me. Um a thought for maybe 97, maybe we do like a top three deal and then kind of disperse the points accordingly. I don't know. Just just throwing out thoughts here. But for now, 96, I think Sean and Diesel still holds on to that. So um, worst match of the year. Ultimate Warrior versus Goldust in your house seven. Yet yeah, none like I've said a couple of times, no like offensively bad matches on the show. Worst match of the night, I don't know, probably Jarrett and Giant, but, you know, I didn't hate watching it. It was a stupid finish, and, you know, I had not a lot of mustard, or maybe even Arn and Lex Luger, just based on the fact that it was kind of heatless, but mechanically it was good. I mean, we talked about it in the episode, right? So, yeah, I don't think anything was worse than <laughs> Warrior versus Gold Dust uh, on this show, so. WWF keeps that negative one point. So no changes thus far. Moving on to the roster and the star power of each promotion. Um, we got best overall. So right now we're tracking WCW as the best overall roster. Now we're talking the diversity of the styles. We're talking the star power, the, the mainstream appeal, the the presence, the just the overall roster, really the quality of the roster. And right now, I think WCW still holds on to that because, uh, like, like I mean, there's been no, the only change since the last time we looked at this is now WCW has Jarrett and Piper, which I wouldn't say is a net negative. So. Um, I think WCW holds on to this for now. Just you got the NWO, you got people coming in left and right. You got X Pac and DiBiase and Jarrett and um, Jericho. Like they're they're pretty stacked as of right now. So WCW holds on to that four points. Wrestler of the year. We are tracking Mankind as the best. Anybody on WCW doing better than Mankind or Shawn Michaels? Those are kind of like the top two, but they're both WWF. So, um, <clears throat> I mean, I wouldn't throw Hogan there, even though he's making a a splash for sure. These performances and these matches, man, like the Super Brawl show that I referenced earlier is the worst of the year. I mean, just a lot of that especially in the beginning of the year. We also, we got to take into account kind of the year as a whole as well. So, um, so not Hogan, maybe a Ray Mysterio, Ray, Ray Mysterio provides a good, uh, a good argument as well. Um, cause Ray's had a couple of good matches with Dean. Um, a really fun match with psychosis and Hoovitude. He's a very reliable guy, but doesn't really have the character that Mankind has. Mankind has one of the best characters going on wrestling at this point. But he's also no slouch in the ring. Like, we just referenced the Mind Games match, you know, on my latest episode. So he can go in the ring, and even the stuff he was doing in ECW in the beginning of the year, and even, like, the Boiler Room Brawl type stuff, like... I, I think this is a category we're going to have to keep an eye on. But right now, I think in my head, it's you know, Ray and Mick Foley. Mick Foley has the way better character. Ray is probably slightly better in the match quality. So with that math, you know, um, 
yeah, I think mankind holds on to that. So, um, unless there's anybody else in WCW, none really pop into mind. Macho Man, maybe no. Yeah, I think that about does it. So, WWF holds on to Wrestler of the Year, Worst Wrestler of the Year, Ultimate Warrior. Um. Who would be, again, you could also make an argument for Hogan here for worst of the year. Um, but, I mean, his performance on this show was not bad for the most part. Like, he's being the heel. He's being silly. Um, the finish and the booking of it isn't really on him, per se. So, and it wasn't really his execution of it that was bad. So, I think Warrior holds on to this one for now. So, WWF keeps that negative one point. So now we move on to out of ring so this is gimmicks, characters, promos, storylines, best overall. We're tracking ECW as the best. Um, I think I said this last time, and I think it still holds true. WCW has the NWO, which we are also tracking as the best uh, character or storyline going on right now. Um, but as a company from, from a company wide standpoint, I think ECW is just better top to bottom, just more well-rounded. They have a lot of good, you know, the, the Douglas and the Pitbulls, Sandman, Raven, uh, the Dudley storyline. They got a lot of stuff going on right now. The promos, the backstage interviews. And I think ECW is just a more complete company from a storyline perspective. So and just a lot of interesting characters. Whereas WCW, it's really the NWO and nothing else. So, um, so I think ECW holds on to the best overall, but I would say NWO still holds on to the best singular storyline going on right now. So no changes there. Worst character storyline, we're checking Jerry Lawler, uh, just from his various feuds with Ultimate Warrior and Jake Roberts and general commentary bullshit, Isaac Yankum, all that stuff. So um, anything on this show worse than that? I don't think so. I don't think so. Um, the battle ball ring is kind of stupid, but I wouldn't say it's that terrible. It doesn't really get in the way of anything. You know what I mean? It's just an unnecessary uh, garnish, I would say. But other than that, I can't think of anything... Um, I mean, you can argue just the bullshit with the horsemen and Luger and there's just not a lot there, but I think it's more of like a neutral indifference than outwardly bad. You know what I'm saying? So I think Jerry Lawler still takes the cake here. So overall, <laughs> all that to say, no changes, uh, this episode here as of Halloween havoc, but we still got a few shows left in the year. Um, for WCW and ECW to try to make a comeback because uh, WWF is still in the lead with 13, WCW with five, ECW with four. And we got, how many shows we got left? We got six shows left. We got In Your House Buried Alive. ECW's only got one show. They only got November to Remember. And then WWF has uh, Survivor Series and uh, In Your House 12, It's Time. And then WCW, of course, has World War III and Starcade. So we'll see how the end of the year fleshes out. But <clears throat> keep abreast. I'll keep you abreast of all that stuff. And like I said last time, we'll do a live uh, finale special where we'll take a look at this again. Um, I'll get your feedback as a listener, as a watcher. Do you disagree with any of this stuff? Do you agree? Do you are you aggressively indifferent? Let's hear it. Let's hear it, baby. But we'll get into that sometime, probably the summer. Um, but with that, I think that's about all daddy has for you today. Thank you guys for listening and watching. Like, rate, review, follow, all that shit, right? Um, yeah, I think that's about all daddy has for you today. We'll be doing... Um, Anything else I got plugged? Join the Discord. I always forget that. 
I can mention the Discord in the intro, but join the Discord. The link's there in the uh, the show notes as well. Um, also, keep make sure you're subscribed to YouTube, and I think I have a Twitch. If I don't, <laughs> I'll, I'll start one. Make sure to follow me. Probably on Twitter is where you're going to keep um, the most notified of, of my happenings, but I think we're going to start streaming some video games. Maybe some retro wrestling, perhaps. Maybe a SmackDown 2. Um, just maybe just general live stream. You know, we'll talk a little bit about the current product, maybe. We'll talk, you know, whatever. Whatever comes up. Um, but I do want to get into the old school video game. Like, I never played the WCW video games. I, I grew up a WWF kid, so I never played Revenge or, what was it, Backstage Assault or... Didn't ECW have a game too? Like I'm a, I want to get into all that stuff. I want to get into all that stuff. I think it'll be a fun time. So make sure you subscribe to the YouTube if nothing else. Um, I'll be streaming everywhere. TikTok, I'll probably be live streaming there as well. And um, yeah, do that. And I think with that, I'll love you. I'll leave you. And I'll leave you with this. Catch it. I just blew you a kiss. If you're listening and you were confused, I blew you a kiss. Um, so now it's just in your ear. My lips are. So. All right. Well, no, you hang up. I'm hard. Yeah. And it's a hard is. Talk around and disregard it. Ship you off the ground, show you what hard is. Standing strong and proud of me. And I guess let's get started. It's the hard is. Talk around and disregard it. Should you walk the ground, should you walk hard is Standing strong and proud, nothing can knock this Let's get started